Good morning, Bante. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So many. Okay. Okay, Bhante. Okay. Let us begin with the uh, Metta recital. May all beings be happy and secure. May all beings have happy minds. Whatever living beings there may be, without exception, weak or strong, long, large, medium, short, subtle or gross, visible or invisible, living near or far, born or coming to birth. May all beings have happy minds. Let no one deceive another, nor despise anyone anywhere. Neither from anger nor ill will should anyone wish harm to another. As a mother who risks her own life to protect her only child, even so towards all living beings, one should cultivate a boundless heart. One should cultivate for all the world a heart of boundless loving friendliness, above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without hate or resentment, whether standing, walking, sitting, lying down, or whenever awake, one should develop this mindfulness. This is called divinely dwelling here, not falling into erroneous views, but virtuous and endowed with vision. Removing desires for sensual pleasures, one comes never again to birth in the womb. Friend, <clears throat> with this uh, very wonderful, almost uh, entire teachings of the Buddha is presented in this uh, discourse in a nutshell. And keep this mind, let us start our mindfulness practice. We pay attention to our breathing, which is universal, clean, and neutral. It doesn't belong to any particular person, or country, or nation, or religion but it is universal factor that condition our body. Keeping this in mind, we breathe in and notice the breath touching our nostrils, expanding our lower abdomen and expanding our chest area. As we breathe out, Lower abdomen contracts, chest area contracts, and the breath leaves our nostrils. This happens every time we breathe in and out, whether we are aware or not. The difference is that when we are aware of this reality, we gain insight of the truth that is impermanence. Even whether we like it or not, it is there, whether the Buddha has come into existence or not. <clears throat> and therefore we notice the breath is moving, rising and falling, Feeling rises and falls, perception rises and falls, thoughts rise and fall, consciousness rises and falls. This happens each time we breathe in and out. The feeling we had when we were breathing in would no longer be there when we breathe out. What if experience when we breathe out will not be there when we breathe in. So you can see very clearly in your personal experience the reality is always there so we pay attention to it. As we do so 
we also notice that there is nothing for us to hold on to as everything is moving our greed slowly fades away as greed fades away the mind becomes even more relaxed calm peaceful the body becomes calm relaxed and peaceful the breath becomes calm peaceful and relaxed and then in that relaxed peaceful state we lose loosen up our rigidity of tightness fades away creating a space for metta feeling to arise metta feeling does not arise when we are uptight and rigid or full of resentment and resentment fades away and then also we notice our mind mind opens up to suffering beings and then compassion arises when this happens then our mind becomes even more active and sleepiness and drowsiness fade away or restlessness and uh, uh, agitation fades away and then mind becomes active sleepiness and drowsiness fade away seeing all this happening the doubt that we had previously would no longer be there when the doubt fades away all these what we call hindrances greed resentment restlessness and worry sleepiness and drowsiness and doubt they slowly fade away then mind we would be full of joy happiness that leads to concentration with the concentrated state of mind we see the deepest changes taking place in us deepest changes taking place in our form the breath feeling perception thoughts and consciousness they always change only when the mind is concentrated that concentrated mind can see these deepest changes and that is why the buddha repeated limitation samahitam cittam yatha bhutam pajanati concentrated in mind sees things as they really are what as they really are mean things are changing all the time and we notice that noticing that we continue our practice this is short practice but this is how it happens even in a long practice suffering may the fear struck be free from fear may the grieving be free from grief so to may all beings be 
collection of various feelings called feelings. Feeling aggregate. Aggregate simply means a collection. A collection of uh, various type of perception through eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind. And the collection of uh, thoughts, all kinds of trillions of thought. And uh, consciousness, eye consciousness, ear consciousness and so forth. These are the collection, groups that we have. The whole bundle of uh, us uh, are made up of these five bundles. And ask this question, is form permanent or impermanent? When you attain the stream entry, you have to get the answer to this question. If you don't ask this question, you don't get a 100% mark. <laughs> You must get, you get a hundred percent marks. Only then can you attain the stream entry. Uh, so, with this answer, what is the answer? Is it permanent or impermanent? What is the answer? Impermanent, venerable sir. Okay, if it is impermanent, it is satisfactory or unsatisfactory? Unsatisfactory vendable, sir, that was the answer they gave. And that is the answer we give to ourselves. You ask uh, uh, Jim, <laughs> if you're a Jim, you ask Jim, your body is permanent or not? Impermanent? Impermanent. If it is impermanent, it is satisfactory or unsatisfactory? Jim, it is unsatisfactory. Why is that? When something is impermanent, you have to keep repairing it. You repair and repair and repair and repair. This repairing is called sankhara. You repair. And then this repairing is pleasant or unpleasant. It's a very big headache. You keep doing it again and you get tired of repairing this. Aggregates. Look at, for instance, body. How much do you do to repair the body? Uh, body is always uh, uh, being conditioned. Conditioned by what? Conditioned by uh, breathing, conditioned by food, medicine and so forth and so on. Uh, and therefore they are, uh, the breath that we breathe in and out is not permanent, it is impermanent. How the body uh, condition, breath conditions the body because become brings oxygen into the body. If oxygen doesn't come to the body, this body will not exist. Every fraction of a second, we breathe. Every time we breathe, we bring oxygen to recharge our deoxygenated the cells to live. See how, how uh, it, it is repairing? And in spite of all this, this body is wearing out, and we keep repairing. I know it for myself. For, for 92 years I have done that, willingly or unwillingly, and I know it is impermanent. My feeling, perception of a gym, you ask yourself. I don't know whether you are gym or not, I just uh, use this name. And your perceptions, you perceive so many things. Ask yourself, are these perceptions permanent or impermanent? Impermanent. When it is, they are impermanent, you have to recharge them. You have to have new perceptions. Again and again and again. Your thought, your feelings, your consciousness, they keep preparing and changing all the time. Actually, this is called knowledge and vision, jnana dasana. Jnana is... Uh, uh, knowledge, in this case, dasan is seeing. When you have this knowledge and seeing, knowledge is that you accumulated throughout all your life. You have lived so many years and you have accumulated this, accumulated this knowledge. And through that knowledge you can see the truth exactly as it is. What is the truth? Impermanence. The very simple question and profound question that the Buddha asked these venerable monks. And this is the question we have to ask ourselves, honestly, sincerely, without any bias. Keep asking this question, day and night, 
any time you want to focus yourself on yourself, ask this question. When do you get a very clear answer through your knowledge and vision, you attain the stream entry. When you attain the stream entry, any time you may, uh, you may not uh, pay attention to when you don't pay attention, uh, you may not know that there is no self. Only when you pay attention, normally uh, the, the, the notion of uh, self uh, is uh, present when we are paying attention. Uh, when we don't pay attention, we don't know whether there is self or not self. We just work. Now, when you pay attention to these aggregates and you see impermanence, at the same time, permanence cannot exist in, the, in your mind. Just remember, you know, in physics, no two objects can occupy the same space at the same time. No two objects. You know that. Similarly, you no know, two thoughts can exist in the mind at the same time. So, when you see impermanence, the notion of permanence cannot exist. When you see not there is no self, the notion of self cannot exist at the same time. When you incorrectly think that there is I, you see I incorrectly. But when you see I and ask the question, is this I permanent or impermanent? <laughs> you see, next moment it is no longer there. So you open your eyes to the truth all the time. All the time. Uh, so you remember uh, today is Saturday. Sunday and Saturday don't happen at the same time. If it is sun Saturday, that is Saturday. Not it cannot be Sunday. Of course, this is conventionally uh, agreed uh, uh, terms to divide times. Similarly, uh, the word no notion of I, uh, we accept our society in order to make our communication easy. We, we all agree to use the word I, you, we, he, she, and so on. We agree to use it. But at the same, even you attain enlightenment, fully enlightenment, Arahant, uh, you have to use it. Even the Buddha used it, the conventional terms. And that we use uh, with understanding and real uh, vision of non-self. When you are fully enlightened, the, the, the difference between this and that, until you attain full enlightenment, the uh, I consciousness keeps lingering in your mind. It is uh, lurking under your consciousness lurk in there. Uh, so, when you attain uh, stream entry, all its uh, apparent gross form completely vanishes, and when you attain the full enlightenment, the notion of I, called I maker, called Ahankara, that Ahankara will totally vanish. Then, not only the notion of I, but the I maker also will disappear. I maker. You make these eyes, eyebrows and so forth. These days people, you know, shave the eyes and make I look beautiful. Not that type. <laughs> but uh, the notion of I the most frequently used one single word in English language. In other languages also they use the, the notion similar to this in their own language. That is the word, <coughs> the notion that they use more often than anything else. So, <coughs> uh, 
the difference between uh, the attainment of stream entry and uh, full enlightenment is that uh, during stream entry, you seeing impermanence, you really, practically understand that there is no permanent self. And yet, that stays until you attain, that stays until you are, uh, even when you attain the anagami state. Even anagami state, you still have this eye maker, ahankara, that will totally vanish when you attain full enlightenment. Now, the next part, the part of the next, the uh, ne next, the second question is, uh, okay, second part of the question, how can one experience abiding anatta and still be confused by sense desire, delusion or ill will? Of course, friend, uh, if you have uh, experienced anatta perfectly, clearly, you will not be confused. You will have a desire and sometimes you may even have uh, uh, anger, not ill will. Ill will is a very powerful mental, negative mental state. Uh, you may, you have desire. You have a desire until you attain full enlightenment. Don't assume that uh, you will overcome and completely destroy your desire by attaining stream entry. Because even that the stream enterer uh, can marry and have children and uh, so forth and do business and so on, they can do that. Uh, once return also may do that. Only anagamis will withdraw from uh, all these things, uh, and especially desire and ill will, uh, anagami will uh, will not have. Uh, but until you when but the desire uh, the exists until you attain full enlightenment. So uh, you may get confused. Uh, if you don't have uh, d destroyed your, uh, what you call, uh, notion of self, uh, because you have um, ego, uh, uh, so once you destroy the notion of self, you will not be totally uh, free from uh, confusion. But, <coughs> but, I must say, uh, until you destroy ignorance, uh, you may have unclear state of mind, unclear state of mind. Uh, like uh, when the, the Buddha uh, was very um, sick, Venerable Ananda, who had already attained the stream entry, uh, when Buddha was very, very sick, Venerable Ananda felt very dizzy in a way, uh, as, as not to know what to do. Uh, when Buddha recovered, Venerable Ananda was very happy that he recovered. During that short period, Venerable Ananda had some unclear state of mind, uh, not because of uh, uh, because he had a uh, uh, notion of uh, uh, self, but because he has not completely destroyed his desire and uh, his uh, attachment to the Buddha. Uh, even though he has attained stream entry. Uh, so attaining stream entry doesn't mean that you have destroyed all the defilements. Okay. Uh, Okay, any other question? Uh, yes. <clears throat> um, here's one. Dear Bhante and uh, Brian, uh, would like to ask if, uh, let's see, in the seven factors of enlightenment, there is piti and equanimity. We consider 
fourth jhana as the highest form of equanimity. In order to attain fourth jhana, one abandons piti. How can piti and equanimity coexist as factors of enlightenment at the same time? Does this mean that different factors of enlightenment don't coexist at the same time? Yeah, you are right. When you attain the fourth jhana, uh, you don't have piti. Uh, you remember the fourth jhana, uh, sukha, sukha, even, even attain the third jhana, piti as a viraga upekkhachuri, sato sampajano. Even when you attain the third jhana, your piti uh, will no longer be there, uh, much less when you attain the fourth jhana. And uh, upekha uh, starts uh, becoming uh, prominent in the third jhana, uh, although it was there in a, a rudimentary, uh, unclear uh, form in lower jhanas as well, but it comes to the forefront when you attain the third jhana. And it becomes pure and clean when you attain the fourth jhana. Both mindfulness and uh, equanimity becomes very clear uh, when you attain the fourth jhana. Uh, I repeated the formula several times. Upekha satipari suddhin chatutta jhana upasampadja vihalati. Uh, also, I mentioned when, the, when one attains the fourth jhana, both equanimity uh, and mindfulness uh, becomes uh, pure and clean. And the equanimity, the highest kind of equanimity, is the equanimity without uh, uh, belief in... Uh, my equanimity, that is called atammayata, atammayata. Uh, that is the atammayata means that which is mine. Tammayata is that which is mine. Atammayata is that which is not mine. Meaning, equanimity arises totally free from all other uh, feelings. Uh, that is the highest kind of equanimity. As you know, equanimity is nanatthasita uh, equanimity, ekatthasita equanimity. Nanatthasita means equanimity arising through uh, six senses. Uh, that is nanatthasita equanimity, nanatthasita upekha. Ekantasita Upekha is the equanimity uh, that arises in the uh, four jhana and on, continues up to the uh, neither perception nor non perception equanimity. And even that equanimity is not perfectly clear, although it is, cl it is clean to a very great extent in the fourth jhana, but the final and the last cleanest state of equanimity can one find when the mind is free from those notion called I consciousness. I consciousness, if equanimity arises with this, that equanimity is not 100% pure. Uh, therefore, it is called uh, atammayata, uh, perfectly clear, pure equanimity. The Buddha said that is the highest kind of equanimity. <clears throat> uh, so definitely, as you said, uh, PT is not in the equanimity. Okay? Uh, next question. We have a few more minutes for... Another question. Dear Bhante, is seclusion a feasible option for those of us who are with family and performing daily tasks? Or do we need to be in a self-isolation slash retreat? Now, actually, if somebody 
learns how to uh, take time off from everything. Uh, one can have seclusion uh, even in one's own house. Of course, if the house is very noisy, there are children and uh, music going on, TV going on, visitors come and so forth, you cannot have uh, quite uh, time or place to have uh, seclusion. Uh, you can have uh, seclusion in a uh, quiet place. You have to select that. So, uh, physically, you are talking about a physical seclusion. And uh, uh, if physical seclusion is possible, then you have to have the other higher seclusion, which is called mental seclusion. Mental seclusion has two types. One is by gaining jhana. Other is the highest mental seclusion that is totally free from psychic irritants or mental uh, defilements. Uh, that is the highest uh, type of seclusion. Uh, that is called upadhi viveka, <coughs> uh, seclusion from all kind of uh, uh, holding uh, assets, uh, free from all of them. Uh, the, you have to think <coughs> that kind of seclusion you can have temporarily for a very brief moment, even in in midst of uh, activities, uh, if you know uh, impermanence, uh, impermanence very clearly, because uh, you can see everything that arises in your mind is slipping away, slipping away, disappearing, 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 as quickly as it appears. If you can focus your mind on that very most subtle, the briefest moment, you will you have a seclusion at that time. So, if you are physically secluded and go away to a cave or solitary uh, place, or forest and so forth. If you carry this uh, uh, desire and uh, resentment and so forth, all this jargon in your mind, you are not secluded. You are with the company. In order to be uh, in this total perfect seclusion, you must see this most uh, subtle, the briefest uh, moment of uh, impermanence, things appearing and disappearing, the mind does not hold on to, cannot hold on to anything. It's simply, you actually can be, can be absorbed in that perfect, perfectly clear, briefest moment without holding on to anything, because things are changing so quickly, and if you can catch that quickest changes in yourself, then you can have a mental seclusion, very good seclusion, even in a, a busy place. So it is a very, uh, all depends, as I mentioned in dependent origination, this whole series of talks on dependent origination, everything depends on how, when, where we train our mind to see the truth. Uh, with this, I want to conclude this morning's talk, uh, answering questions. As I mentioned, we started our morning meditation with metta, and now we want to conclude this session with metta. That doesn't mean metta is uh, complete or finished, ended, or the practice is ended. Uh, this is the ending of a particular session. Both the practice 
and metta will continue in our life. Friends, let us wish all those beings who are currently suffering from COVID-19, hospitalized and are under the care of doctors, nurses and hospital staffs. We want uh, them to be free from that disease and return to their regular life and live long in very good health and continue their Dhamma practice. Others are there who also are uh, suffering for, for, for losing their loved ones, uh, grieving, and we want to wish them to be free from that grief through the understanding of Dhamma. There is no other way to overcome grief, only through the uh, through a perfect or clear understanding of Dhamma, we can overcome that. And I want them to have this understanding of Dhamma and overcome their uh, griefs. And there are some others <coughs> uh, who are helping them in many ways. Uh, doctors and so on. Others are making financial support and material material support to help them, these people. There are leaders who are, some leaders have done a very wonderful job and reduced this uh, virus uh, spreading in their own respective areas. And other leaders are still maybe trying hard and thinking day and night of ways of uh, reducing this and may they have wisdom, understanding, determination and compassion to come up with a, a reasonable solution uh, to help these people. With this metta thought, let us uh, uh, end this session and I thank you very much for your participation and if you don't participate and encourage me, I would not take time to uh, teach this uh, Dhamma. If you are, if there is no audience, whom shall I teach? Teach myself. Okay, I hope you continue your practice. <laughs> and attend the Thank, Thank you, you. Bhante. Bhante.